Welcome uh, to our final NAC Ask Me Anything of the Fall 2022 semester. Uh, my name is Burçin Mecer Gerber. I am an a NAC member and a professor and the department chair of Sonia Stani, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Southern California. Uh, the National Academy of Construction was established to recognize our industry leaders. An important purpose of the Academy is to provide a network system of linkage between past and present participants in the construction industry. As such, we have established this Ask Me Anything series to help transfer knowledge to our next generation of construction leaders. Who are you? The format of the, of the webinar is very simple. Our speakers will make a short presentation about a topic and their perspective on the industry. If you haven't already, please email your questions to nacama at colorado.edu. And I think Sandy is going to put that email address in the chat. One student will win $500 scholarship, which will be announced at the end of this event. Well, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dan Angelo, who is a principal civil engineer at Applied Research Associates. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the State University of New York Buffalo and an MBA from Norwich University. Dan is a leading executive level technical advisor on project delivery methods and making risks on complex managing risks on complex and challenging transportation infrastructure projects. Before joining Applied Research Associates, he worked for the New York State Department of Transportation from 1988 to 2017. A key position with the Transportation Department was Deputy Chief Engineer for the Office of Design and Project Delivery and as, as Risk Manager to the Executive Steering Committee and Federal li Liaison for for the 3.9 billion New York, uh, New New York uh, Bridge. Dan also spent six years leading the Strategic Highway Research Program number two for the National Academies of Science. The goal of this program was to find solutions to improving highway safety, reducing congestion, and improving methods for renewing roads and bridges. He is also a licensed professional engineer, a project management professional, and a risk management professional. He has received several awards, including the Design National uh, Award from the Associ American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials and the Commissioner's Award of Excellence from the New York State Department of Transportation. Among his many professional association involvements, he is an active member of ASCE. He is a member of the New York State Education Department State Board for Engineering, Land Surveying and Geology and is the chair of the Civil, Structural and Environmental Engineering Department Advisory Board at the University of Buffalo. Dan, uh, as you can see, uh, is very accomplished and uh, we are uh, very lucky to have some of his time today and take it away Dan, uh, the floor or Zoom is yours. <laughs> Great, great. Thank you. And thank you for, the, for that introduction. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and I, I can't wait to get into these questions. And I, I thought before we jumped into the questions, I'd just give a little five to 10 minute kind of background of my career and some projects I got involved in. Maybe it'll prompt some questions. Um, and really, I'm, I'm game for opening, you know, for answering any questions. So let me go to a few slides I have here. It's just um, a handful of slides. I'll just I'll walk through them. Some of it We've already covered, so I'll skip through it pretty quickly. Um, so just, you know, as background mentioned, I have a, a Bachelor of Science and, a, and an MBA and some certifications through the Project Management Institute for a Project Management, Risk Management, and actually even Portfolio Management. All right, so my, I, I thought it might be interesting to, you know, when I was in, in college, like what, what was, what a career path you went. So I started out with this slide here. Uh, to demonstrate how you know, my career progressed through different organizations. And I actually really started out working for Quaker Oats, if you can believe it. It sounds like a cereal company, right? But they, at, at one point, they owned Fisher Price Toys. And I worked uh, during college, actually, as an internship. Uh, and I actually got college credit for for doing it, uh, working in the facilities management. They had a dozen or so buildings, infrastructure, um, had some structural issues, uh, you know, heating, ventilation, 
uh, those type of issues, which was just a wealth of experience that I got uh, while I was completing my undergraduate degree. So if you're not doing an internship, that's something I would highly encourage it. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of jobs in high school and so forth, uh, but none were an engineering firm. So this this that was really eye opening to me and even got me more excited about the profession. Then after I graduated from um, University of Buffalo with my undergraduate and BS in civil engineering, I went, it was a recession time and thank gosh, the government was hiring, they were doing infrastructure. Um, almost half our class ended up working for the New York State Department of Transportation. And I think these government organizations are an awesome opportunity. You can really see a lot from an owner's perspective, owning certain infrastructure assets. Um, and, and I worked in our Syracuse regional office, our New York City area, our Buffalo regional office, and then and eventually in, in, I'll be in, in the headquarters and then a statewide role. And, and what's interesting about working for an agency like the state of New York is that each of these regional offices are almost like separate companies, separate organizations. So maybe think a little bit broader of, of uh, when you're looking for jobs of the opportunities that these provide. They all have different unique uh, aspects to them and different types of um, environments you're working in. Can you, imagine, you can imagine New York City compared to the Syracuse area. It's quite different. So I spent 30 some plus years with New York State Department of Transportation and then the last six or so years with Applied Research Associates in the consulting business, um, mainly consulting for federal government and state agencies and other transportation agencies as a peer reviewer of projects and doing some research for them and, and those type of things. And I'll get more into that. So the, the other thing I wanted to just mention and, and it was highlighted uh, earlier, you know, the professional organizations, I think, are key uh, in, in this business. You need to stay on top of uh, the trends in the industry, you need to keep yourself educated, uh, and also great opportunity to make connections and contacts, right? This is a very much a people-driven business, requires teamwork, almost all engineering is, is you're never going to do anything individually. So the more you get involved in organizations, um, the better off you're going to be throughout your career. And I think maybe many of you are probably in the ASE uh, uh, student chapter. Uh, we mentioned that, you know, National Academies, I got involved in that and shared some committees there, Transportation Research Board, and doing research projects, uh, reviewing them as a panel member, chairing some panels, and actually doing contract work for TRB. So uh, all, every one of those has been a great experience and, and great connections. And just you, you, learn, you learn a lot from the people that, that are involved in these activities. Then of course, the Project Management Institute, uh, a lot of what I've done is got involved in project delivery and project management, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, and then of course, the National Academy of Constructions is another great organization where you make connections and share, share, share your experiences. As was also mentioned, uh, you know, it, you get, I've gotten involved in some boards. We have these opportunities to either participate in a board or become a board member. Um, I'm actually on five boards now, and they're all they're all wonderful. I, you know, it's part of giving back to the community, back to the industry. Um, though I'll tell you, I, I, I probably learn, I probably get more out of them than I give them. To be honest with you, I mean, manage, I'm on the editorial board for the Journal of Management and Engineering, and getting to review the the contemporary research and all the uh, um, papers that are being presented and for publication and deciding is it worthy or not but just learning about what is going on in industries is absolutely a, a fantastic opportunity so I encourage you to stay involved in these organizations um and i would never have guessed 30 40 years ago that i'd be reviewing pe applications and approving people for licensing in new york state but that's part of the activities on the board uh, of the engineering and also looking at disciplinary things and trying to keep the profession and the current laws and regulations up to snuff with uh, in regards to engineering land survey and geology and then these are the three boards at the university. Uh, I chair the Civil uh, Structure Environmental D Department uh, External Advisory Board, also on the Institute of Bridge Engineering Board. And by because I'm chair, I'm automatically on the in School of Engineering Applied Science. So it doesn't doesn't look as impressive as it is. Um, but that's working with all the schools and the dean. So uh, again, just a great opportunity to share your experiences and to learn from others. So uh, look for those opportunities as your career grows. Um, but it's all about. So I'm going to now jump to, it's all about projects, right? So um, that's, you know, most of my career has been on the design, design, construction, project delivery side. And I'm just throwing up some, some examples of some, I just want to throw out some examples of projects that I've worked on throughout my career to get you thinking about the diversity 
uh, in the in the transportation infrastructure area, heavy heavy civil construction. The first is just a map representing. Um, later, my Craig actually managed a portfolio of uh, a bus rapid transit system, and these were and so it involved dedicated lanes, ramp metering, uh, building stations, deciding where it was, public outreach stakeholders uh, between two major counties and um, in the Lower Hudson Valley of New York State. So that that map is. This picture on the far right side here, maybe some of you might recognize it, but that's uh, the west side of Manhattan. Um, so er in the late 80s, early 90s, I actually was involved. I, I, I co-led the environmental impact statement and preliminary engineering for designing the west side highway, which is from the tip of Manhattan all the way up to 59th Street, which is the beginning of um, Battery, Battery um, Central Park. And it's about five, a little over five miles. And memory of I don't remember, but this was an elevated highway was down through here. It was removed and we put in a boulevard concept. And was why, why I mentioned this project is because it was one of the first projects that things were changing where things had to be more contextual, context sensitive, those type of things. And that's what we did here. We built, uh, you can see it's tree lined and it fit, as it progressed through different parts of Manhattan, the, the, the context of the, the highway changed to match that area. And this picture here in the middle is, is showing the walkway bikeway that was built as part of that. So it runs the whole length of Manhattan along between the river and the highway. And this last, the, the last image here on, this, on the screen of this, this Google map is of the New York State Thruway exit 34. It's one of my very first projects I worked on. I had a simple job of replacing this bridge that was over the Conrail main line. And I just demonstrate this to show you that probably the easiest part of this project was actually doing the bridge design, right? There were, there were it's, it the, was much more involved when you start figuring out the environmental impacts and then doing that analysis and um, getting all the stakeholders involved. So there was a, there's a trout stream here. There was a major utility, historic canal bridge through here. We had to redo this intersection. We had, the bridge was being raised so that the profile to the throughway had to be changed. Was it from a Y to a T intersection? All right, so a simple bridge project became this very complex uh, project in the, in the kind of rural environment, but very challenging and very exciting to, to learn all those aspects of project delivery. A big part of my career, probably one of the best jobs I, ever, I had was I, I got, uh, after years of experience and being leading design projects, I got uh, to become... Uh, the bureau director for for design quality assurance bureau in new york state and i actually oversaw all the policies for delivering projects in new york state so we developed a project development manual we maintained the highway design manual standard specifications we didn't have a risk management process we created one for that when i, I led a team that created that process we created the new york state's um, design build procedures mail before we even had approval to do design build and then engineering instructions and bulletins. And these are just some examples here, standard sheets, um, right? All, all projects require some guidance, some process, um, some standards to work on. And, and that was actually very, um, very exciting and very thrilling for me to, to kind of get involved in that. And you'll see how some of this played later in my career where I'm doing the same thing now more at the national level. So here's some more pictures of some projects that was mentioned. This, these are all the Tampin Z Bridge or the, the new, the Mario Cuomo Bridge now. Uh, it was a three-mile, eight-lane facility with a dedicated bus lane. Uh, that's where the bus rapid transit system went over this bridge and also has a walkway, uh, pedestrian bikeway on the, the northern structure um, on the northern side of it. So just some pictures, uh, just to put some things in perspective of the size. The girders were 20 feet deep in some areas. This is an eight-foot diameter case on that's being drilled to, to support the main towers, climbing, climbing, um, plug climbing towers for, for pouring the, the, the piers on the, the, the main uh, columns on the, on the bridge, you know, and then obviously the, re the reinforcing and getting that to, to all work. So just uh, a, a very exciting project. Look for these opportunities. Um, I always, I always jump that um, the challenging projects and where uh, the kind of projects people shied away from. I always thought they were the, the best ones to be, to be working on. And so How's it all led? So after I left the state of New York, I got involved more on the national level. Um, but some of this is, was because I was involved with some national organizations that led led me to take on some of these projects. So this is just examples of some uh, uh, processes and policies that we've developed for the federal government under my, with my current company. We're currently working on developing quality assurance guidelines for bridge construction. 
we identified the top 10 biggest bridge construction issues in the country and we're doing case studies on them and and uh developing some field field manual and quality assurance program guides um we developed this tool that's called the case web tool it's a alternative contracting method selection so you put in your project information do some risk analysis and it'll give you an idea of what's the best way to deliver that project whether it's design bid build design build cm at risk those type of delivery systems and we can talk about that if you want you have more questions bridge bundling guidebooks another process that we've published um, for FHWA value capture gets into how you fund your projects and then we took the bridge bundling and turned it to uh, project bundling so you, this is just uh, some smattering like some examples of some federal uh, guidance and policies that we've established that I've been involved in and just to wrap it up some other big projects I've worked on just to give you some highlights this is uh, a Car Army Corps of Engineers project they're replacing the Saint or re rehabilitating the St George's Bridge over the Delaware Chesapeake uh, canal in, in the state of Delaware it's a rehabilitation project which is a totally different animal than say new construction and you can see some of the some of the wear and tear and and things that need to be fixed from the joints to the deck to the railing to the to the hangers and so forth so I did some value engineering for them and helped them um, nail down that scope of work and how, how to approach that project and on the right hand side this is the Verrazano's Narrows Bridge and we're currently working on a project um, with the MTA advising them on um, doing some peer review for them and helping them do some risk analysis on how to um, change the Brooklyn approaches they're they're going to make a this is a left-hand exit now they want to make it a right-hand exit that goes to the Belt Parkway along the, the Hudson River and Staten Island in the background so just some very exciting big projects um, that you get involved in all, as you can tell all all over the place what type of experiences and type of things you can you can end up doing and I think that's all I have I'm just gonna I'm gonna end right there we open it up open up to questions um this slide just uh may prompt you to ask some questions but uh, some of the things that are required to deliver a project successfully are lifted up listed on the left side and um all projects goes through all projects go through certain steps in the process and that's on the right right side right someone's got to initiate it someone's got to plan it someone's got to execute it oversee it and then you got to close it out right so having said that I will um, turn it back to you, Brickin, and we can start taking questions. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for that introduction. I have many questions here, so I'm going to try to cover as uh, many as possible. Um, oh, my lights went off. <laughs> um, so I will start with, uh, with with your experience in project delivery methods and, and risk management. So I'm going to start this uh, question that combines both. And it's a question from Tom Foyami. What type of project delivery method comes with the least, ri least risk in mega projects? Yeah, well, great, great question. And I'm, I'm going to, every, every, answer to every question asked today is going to be it depends okay so that's that's the correct answer for everything it depends right so I, I, the question depends on what perspective you're coming from are you talking about risk from the owner side or risk from the contractor side for example and they're, they're quite different right so but if you look at um different it's a great question because project delivery methods are and I always describe them as they're nothing more than different ways of allocating risk to different parties so if you think of it in those terms design bid build the owner retains most of the risk they own the design they have the design responsibility um, they take up they take that on and kind of means and methods uh, specifications is how you deliver those projects so any kind of changes errors are going to be on the owner you go you can go all the way to design build or public private partnerships where you're turning a lot of that risk over to the contracting or design build team right so um the method that works where where you're kind of equally sharing risk and they kind of go to the right party is um construction manager general contractor so it's usually a partnership between a designer of record a contractor and the owner you're sitting down you're developing the project developing solutions developing how you're going to construct it, bid packages um and you're at uh, while you're doing that you're sharing the risk and I think if you look at the research and the the um the data on those different delivery methods you'll find that cmgc is probably the one that saves the most time and money um, overall because of that process now there are certain reasons so you may ask why don't we why are all projects delivered that way there's well there's 
there's advantages and disadvantages, right? There's differences on why that would be done. Because one requires the uh, owner being more involved in the project. Uh, so it requires certain resources to be dedicated they may not have or expertise. Great. But is that clear? Just, just ask again. Ask another no, question. No, 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 I think that was a great answer. And it was a high level question, right? So we're going to dive into a little bit more specific questions now around risk. Um, and this is this is a question from uh, uh, Josia Godi, and it is I'll read the question, uh, and it is related to challenging projects uh, or or some unique aspects you might have encountered uh, in a project. How do you approach assessing and managing risk for a new technically challenging project? that doesn't have many similarities with past projects or a project that has a technical aspect that hasn't ever been designed or built before? Yeah, so I th that's a, another great, great question. So um, you're talking like innovation, something new or something that hasn't been done before. So you, you can't do risk management. You can't do any type of project scope cost schedule management right without having a clear understanding of what you're trying to accomplish so what the project goals and objectives are and and in, in a lot of in our terms and when we were in new york when i was with new york state dot we talked about uh, the purpose and need of the project so that's where i would start is that how well defined is that and really what are you trying to accomplish right um and um how do you know you need new technology or, or how do you know it's going to be something that's never been done before is a, is a good question so um you start with start with a good clear uh, purpose and need and then you bring in the you know i would use subject matter experts uh, within your organization outside your organizations across the country um even internationally to help to bear on it uh, on on the problem that you're trying to solve and the goals you're trying to accomplish um there's tech techniques like the delphi technique where you can you can solicit input from experts um where, where they're not um, biasing each other and it works very well a lot of research has done that done that way on these complex projects so there's tools and techniques you can use to to help arrive at that but you need to start with, with trying to make sure you understand what you're truly trying to uh, to accomplish with um, the project great thank you dan um i will get uh, it a little bit more personal to your experience uh so this is a question from tolu sani what is the most challenging risk management process you have encountered in your career? The most challenging risk management process? It, so ri risk, the risk management process um, is pretty standardized across all industries, right? It's, it's um, you, you put a risk management plan together, you, you identify risk, you evaluate the risk, you analyze the risk, and you respond to the risk, right? So the kind of the general steps are, are all the same. Where it gets comp complicated is on on the project, right? And the, the effort you apply to risk management really should be equal to the the project scope and all that, right? So you don't you don't want to be spending money and time on risk management that's the value isn't there for the project, right? So that's the challenge is, is right sizing it. Um, I mean, I've been I've been done risk management for a million dollar projects. I've done them for four billion dollar projects, so and they're, they're totally different. So. The bigger projects, you're going to get into Monte Carlo simulations and modeling. Um, you're going to use, um, you know, uh, impact curves as opposed to points and those type of things. So it can be pretty com complex. And and the more people you have involved, and the bigger the projects, obviously, um, the more complex it's complex it's going to be. Um, but like with anything, I think the biggest issue with risk management is probably communication. It's a great communication tool, uh, but it's communicating and and not only collecting and analyzing, but getting that expertise in that you need. I'm not sure it's answering the question, but. Well, well I'll, I'll follow up with a very specific uh, question now. Uh, you mentioned the Tapan uh, Z bridge project. And this question is coming from Robert Schneider. How did the, the many risks of the Tapan Z pro bridge project correlate or extrapolate from a standard bridge project? And how were these major risks, risks mitigated? What are some of the lessons learned from any risks that escalated throughout the duration of this milestone project? 
Yeah, okay, so we could probably spend a month talking about this. <laughs> get in detail. But let's see if I can give a, a short answer. So it was a very big project, and it was uh, it was delivered using design build, right? And and the project had a lot of, um, if you know the history of the project, it was um, the New York State Department of Transportation and New York State through a were doing it jointly in the environmental assessment and the pre-construction and doing the RFP and uh, RFQ request for proposals request for qualifications process uh, was actually going on at the same time the environmental assessment was going on and then once they got to a selected contractor the um, New York State Thruway Authority took over the project managing it and the DOT stepped aside even though I stayed involved in the project I was the federal I was the liaison for the through the federal government for for the project but also the risk manager so it, there's a lot of different phases we were doing risk assessment on the environmental impact statement we were doing a risk assessment on the procurement process and we we're correlating them and then once we hit to construction we had the design builder had to do a risk assessment we did our own risk assessment and so didn't the federal government who was overseeing because there was 1.8 billion dollars of federal aid on that project through a tifia through a, through a loan so um yeah so the in the number of risk on the project were in the thousands right you can you can imagine there was there was um, work on land. There was a lot of work on the water. There was the, the approaches. There was the main span. Um, there were facilities being built. There was a, a new tolling system that was being put in place, the walkway, bikeway. So you can imagine the, the amount of risk uh, on that project, um, all being all while the, the two agencies involved and one agency executing it using a del project delivery method they had never used before. Right. So that was a big part of the challenge was using design build and how the owner, um, the owners could re would um, relate to that process and how the how the design builder team actually would um, use it. it was on a process that had even though we had a procedure manual in place, um, it had never been used particularly on that scale. Uh, that scale. That's fascinating. Um, are there any lessons learned from these risks? Uh that you encountered throughout this project yeah i think i think the biggest the biggest lessons learned in, in fact the federal government part of their objectives on the project was to capture lessons learned on mega projects and design build and share that on others so what so some of the lessons that they came out of it on this kind of um, national level if you will were that that risk management really is beneficial and and they've come up with processes to apply on all their big projects across the country, right? And make sure it's a formal, formal process. And their their quality assurance and oversight role uh, is a risk based approach now, right? So that's how they they approach these projects is taking a look at it from risk, and that's where they're gonna where those high risk areas are, that are identified. That's where they're gonna focus their resources and effort on it. Um, there were some issues with the quality assurance on the project. It was a, such a big project that the the owners, we decided to give the responsibility of quality assurance to the design build team. Uh, it had to be a separate firm. It had to have firewalls, but was underneath the design build contract. Probably in hindsight, we'd probably, if the agency would probably own that contract the next time around, have more of a direct control over those activities. Um, contractor had some had some big risk with the foundation work and piling. They give you some examples of some risk responses. They, they brought in... Um, um, from the Gulf Coast, um, oil welders that work on oil uh, platforms to, to weld, the, they had problems welding the piles, these eight foot diameter piles, caissons that were going into the sea. So they had to bring that in to bring that expertise in to make sure the welding was done right. They um, they continued to see plans for concrete batch plants because concrete batch plants were all on barges or all out in the river. Uh, they failed, the whole project came to a, a halt. So they had backup plans for, for um, those type of that that those type of uh, risks that were there they had um, um, um if, you, if you followed the project at all they had the, the world's largest floating crane was involved on and the project it was out in san francisco came through the panama canal came up the, up the coast to new york um and it was able to list these girder assemblies well that crane um failed or had mechanical problems there there were no other cranes around that could do that right so they had to have contingency plans or, or responses where they had uh, alternative means and methods of installing the, the assemblies so a few examples i could i mm -hmm. could talk about this As you said, for uh, hours. you can probably spend uh, a couple lectures on this topic yeah, yes probably. absolutely 
Oh, thank you so much. Uh, so just uh, moving away from risk management and the particular or part specific projects, uh, I'll ask uh, a more generic future oriented question. And this is Joshua Martin's question. How do you see transportation engineering changing over the next 10 years? Yeah, yeah great, great question, Joshua. Yeah, it, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, the one way of looking is I look back over my career and see how it's changed, right? So what are, what are some of the contemporary issues now or what, what is our industry facing? You're, you're, I'm sure you're learning about it, you know, things like sustainability, resiliency are, are massive issues, right? Uh, so how do you, how do you, design and build more sustainable features how how do you make them more resilient to climate change that's occurring um you think about the 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 um extreme events weather events right the the rain events for example are much more severe and concentrated uh, and they're occurring more frequently right the 100 year storm is changing dramatically right so think about all the culvert systems and drainage systems that have been built like on the highway bridge network that probably don't have that capacity now. So how do you, how are you going to deal with, with, with that? So those are two big areas. The, you know, the, the whole um, diversity, equity, justice, inclusion is, is very, very big too. And not only in our industry across the country, although even, even in the world, but how, how do we, um, how does our workforce reflect that? How does the academic world reflect that? How does our contractors, our engineering reflect that? And how do we um, consider all those things in our project designs, in our solutions? Right? We're all about projects and solving problems. How is that folded in to what we're doing? And it should really be folded into everything we do. It's not a standalone thing, right? It's, it needs to be incorporated until all our activities, our processes, our specs, our standards, those type of things. Um, so sustainability, resiliency, you know, what I, what, what we call JEDI or justice, equ equity, diversity, and inclusion. And then th technology is changing dramatically, right? Think, think about um, changing materials, um, just in the processes, procedures. I mean, it wasn't all that long ago, if you think about it, roundabouts weren't very, weren't used in this country at all, right? Simple, uh, things simple as, um, Rumble strips on highways have saved millions of it, hundreds of lives, thousands of lives. Roundabouts have reduced, you know, serious fatal accidents by ninety some percent. So you know, these things are changing, and, you, and as as those approaches or processes change, uh, we need to change to reflect that, right? So one reason why I would encourage you to stay involved with your professional organizations, and you need to be an engineer. You need to be a lifelong learner because things change all the time. So. I know it's a very high level answer. Maybe not what they're looking for, but. No, that's, that's great advice. And uh, actually that ties to the next question. And I read uh, one of Tolosani's uh, questions, but the second one I think ties really well. And I'm sure this is a question many of our students would like to have an answer for. What are those skills that a young civil engineering graduate student interested in a project management career should be focused on developing? I think you touched on it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's a great, great. Yeah, so not everybody wants to be a project manager, but you know, I, I really encourage you to look at it because that's where the fun is, right? You got to bring people together and and pull off, um, try to achieve whatever the project goals objectives are, right? So, um, I, I'm, I'm going to reshow that reshow that last slide. Can I do that? Yeah. Let me let me share the slide again. So yeah, so if you want to become a project management, you know, project manager, these are the skills that if you think about it, it doesn't even have to be an infrastructure or civil engineering project, it could be any type of project, right? But they all require some knowledge or, or skill sets and and managing the scope of the project and, and schedule management, cost, quality, all these things listed. You gotta understand risk management, which is probably not utilized nearly as much as it should be. Um you got you're gonna have to have people working for you, so you gotta hire, fire people. You gotta understand different procurement procedures. Stakeholders are involved in it, internal, external, right? And the hardest is probably integrating all of them. Um, and I purposely skip communications because I think that's key. So there's one area if you were if I were to focus on would be in communications, um, and it takes all kinds of forms of communication, right? It can be can be verbal, can be written, could be electronic. Um, and if you if you think about um, communication 
you know, there's a, a sender and a receiver and the number of people involved on these projects, you can un understand why it's a challenge. And at the Project Management Institute will tell you 70 to 80% of project failure failures can be traced back to a failure in communication. So that's key. Um, everybody knows the formula for calculating the number of uh, communication channels. It's very simple. It's the number of people or stake and in groups involved times that number minus one divided by two, right? So if you have just 10 people involved um, on a project, there's, there's literally 45 different ways of communication that could be occurring on that on that group, right? And you think about these projects that have thousands of them. So the number of communication channels on a project is, um, can grow very rapidly. So communication, I, I when I was undergraduate, I took a, I took a, a writing class um, hmm. In college, and they they love me in the class because all the all the literature majors I really helped lower the curve for them, so they really enjoyed me there. But um, you know, so you can look at those type of things and think think outside the uh, the kind of core curriculum. I don't know if I'm answering the question. Is that getting at the answer? Yeah, I think so. Yes, definitely. Uh, those are important skill sets uh, for our uh, students uh and young engineers um yeah and, i mean you can there's also um things like the project management institute where you can get certifications and, and uh, you know learn a lot more about these different skills that are required um to, to elevate your 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 knowledge in those areas and how it applies to projects you know though i would encourage those type of things also great um so i have the same question twice from two different people. Uh, one, um, uh, these uh, are Mason Eger Mier and Ayodeji Ajid Dahon. Uh, what was the most challenging project you faced, and how were the solutions developed? What uh, I guess some of the solutions you developed to face that challenge. Yeah, I mean, I mean, all all, pro, all you know, all, in, to some degree, all, all all projects have their challenges, right? And they're, they're uh, I I like the ones that are more challenging. The, the projects that people tend to shy away from because they were challenging, I I, I kind of gravitated towards them. Um, figure you can't go wrong, can't mess up too much, right? So, um, yeah, the most challenging, you know, obviously, the Tampa Z, just because of its size, and we you know we were doing something new with a new delivery method. Um, I was asked to to oversee all the risk on the project from the owner's perspective. So coordinating, managing that with a design build team, um, and then with the you know the the federal government that was overseeing it was was very was very challenging. Required a lot of um, you know time and effort put into to think of how that process and what tools we were going to use to make that that make that effective. Um, but even putting the RFP together in that project, I wrote a lot of the. Uh, the specifications that went into that on the quality I, you know, I said we do quality assurance differently probably i i actually wrote that section so um uh, you know I, on that project how we were going to manage that so that that was a challenge um and again, I, i'll just go back on all the biggest challenge of most projects is comes down to this communication right wow. so uh, it, it was just magnified by the scope and size of the project on, on that one but all projects the biggest challenges will be um communication right there's pressure to keep the budget there's pressure to keep the schedule um that th but there's also pressures to add scope to take away scope um you know you got so many different players you got internal and external stakeholders Th those are the challenging things on on, the, on on most projects great yeah no i agree with that even though i'm not working on uh projects uh at the magnitude that you're working on communication still remains to be the most challenging uh issue um so this question is a little uh, personal related to your educational and professional career and it's from Ina Stekarus if you could go back in your educational or professional career would you change anything what is something you wish you did more or less of yeah, great, great question, boy. Um, so my, I, I, I have no complaints about my career. I, you know, it's, it's never expected where it went. I never expected to work for government, but you know, when, when I graduated, there was a recession going on, and government was trying to get us out of the recession. So I ended up there, and it worked out, worked out fantastic. I, um, you, know, you, you, any job you can make, make it, make out of it what you want to be. So, 
I took every training opportunity I had to learn something new. I tried getting experiences. I, I switched jobs multiple times within the eight state agencies from even from, from say from Syracuse to Albany, which is you know, three hours apart, you know, moving, um, uh, because it was a more challenging assignment. It wasn't even for promotions, right? So I didn't do it for, for they always turned out to be promotions in the long run, but I did it because it was a challenge. Um, things I would do different in my, you know, I took thermodynamics in my career. Don't ask me why. Uh, I probably wouldn't have taken that course. <laughs> Again, mechanical engineers loved me in that course too, because I helped lower the curve for them also. And it was a required course for them. Um, I kind of wish I took more like statistics. Um, so, so yeah, some of those, but they, they're not, they weren't, you know, big, big issues. I kind of wish I would have gotten a, maybe I got a, a master's degree when I was younger. I never did in, in engineering. I ended up getting a, a master's in business administration because I was in leadership uh, positions and running organizations. And I f knew things weren't going right. So I need to learn, I need to learn more about how, how they could be done better. So, uh, you know, I made those mid-career changes, uh, got that degree much later in my career than I probably should have. But, um, I'm not sure there's a right or wrong. It's nothing, nothing I really regret. And, you know, and the grass is always greener on the other yeah, side. I mean, yeah. you have an MBA, you wish you have a master's in engineering. If it was the other way, probably would wish uh, to have an MBA. Um, uh, but I think this question you can, uh, you can relate, uh, and, um, as Christians, Jimmy's uh, question, and I think I know where they're coming from. They're young engineers and looking at a long, lifelong career. What piece of experience from your early jobs did you carry into your professional engineering career? Yeah, I think I think I've already said it. I I, I looked at everything as a learning opportunity, and and then when I was with the New York state government, they would often offer training classes on certain topics. Um, you know, whoever was interested could take them. I, I tried taking as many as I could. So, um, I think becoming diversified, right. Knowing, but if, if I had to look back and say, what's my biggest observation say in government, when I was in the, in the government, or even in, even in the consulting world, my biggest observation about most people is they, they're very focused on what they're doing, but they don't, not all, not everybody, and it's bad to stereotype and and make these broad brush assumptions. But in general, most people um, are very focused on what they're doing. They don't really understand where it fits in the bigger picture, what comes before them, or where it goes afterwards. So, I think pay attention to that. You know, what your role is, your role is important. Your task, whatever you're doing, um, but you got to understand how that fits in the bigger picture of accomplishing the overall goal and understanding the things that occur before that and things that are going to occur after that right because it makes a difference on how you approach your approach your job right I, I always argued as as a design director that doing more design um to a certain extent is is better for the organization because it, in theory it reduced construction cost right you're doing a better design and you're having a more more billable project less errors and emissions um but our metric our measurement was uh, Engineering costs related to was a percentage of construction, right? So if you think about that, if engineering costs go up to lower your construction costs, your your percentage of engineering is higher. All right, it's kind of counterintuitive, and, and really, but you're, you you got to look at it um, the big the big picture. You know what's what's best for the the project or the organization and and, and the goals that they're trying to achieve. Great, um, I believe we're approaching our uh, the end of our session. Uh, I think we would. Uh, we would be done uh, very soon, uh, but I have a couple more questions, maybe one more. This is Joao's, uh, Joao Nunes' uh, question. Uh, knowing the need in renewing aging infrastructure in America accounted for in the restore and improve urban infrastructure. This is uh, one of NAE's grand challenges and your experience in the area. What do you believe is the biggest challenge for restoring infrastructure in areas such as New York City? Would it be the political challenges, the need for public awareness, funding, or all of the above, or something else? <laughs> yeah, that's a great, great question. We, and we've been dealing with this for, for, for years now, right? So it always starts with, is there enough, enough funding to accomplish what needs to be done, right? And a lot of the, especially the in the northeast part of the country, and I'm not so sure if it's true in the southwest, but a lot of the infrastructure is built in the 50s, 60s timeframe, a lot of bridges. If you look, look at the the, the um, 
age of bridges, and they're all kind of coming, they're all kind of failing or, or get end of their useful life um, all, all around the same time, right? So how do you deal with that kind of influx? And um, so that's a big challenging is is the the, the fun, funding for that. But also there's a lot of things that we can do as engineers and solving it and how we deliver the projects and the technology we use and the tools we use. Um, you know, can save a lot of money. You can actually get a lot more out of the existing funds we have, right? By doing things uh, differently or, 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 or better. Um, things like 3D modeling and all electronic plans and machine controlled grading, all those type of things that you're probably learning about that that are taking place now or are advancing weren't taking place place years ago and they're actually more cost effective, right? So you can you can we can do a lot more um with the money we have by doing things things differently. So yeah, so I think that's the number one challenge. It is it is um you know, the engineering is only one part of the, of the of the equation. You're absolutely right in that. that you know, the politics. When you mentioned politics, um, it, it in the in the in the public and how are the, are they aware of it and uh, how do they understand it? So I think if you look at bond issues and stuff that are voted on, a lot of them pass, 60, 70 percent pass. So there's some kind of understanding for the for the need needs, but maybe not as universal as it as it could could be. Um, you know, it's you know, you don't you don't want a bridge to fail someone to, to get injured or killed right before you wake wake up to it so how how we how we portray that um again it goes back to communication right asc does the report card which is one great way of saying here's the infrastructure grades uh, and what can be done to try improving them those type of things uh, all get to that whole communication side of our of our business and yeah it requires it requires legislation often which you know how do you so it requires the, knowing the politics it requires communicating those needs but also how we're gonna how we're gonna help uh, address those needs, and it's not not doing things we the way we've always done it, right? There's we, we've talked about this: the technology, the process changes are all all improving things, and you, you're accomplishing more for the same amount of money, if you will. So, getting more money, you can do more, right? And it's kind of a high level. I know my and, two cents. And I I I know we're up on our time, but I really want to ask this question. Yeah, no, I got time. This Go is ahead. the last question. And it's uh, and you mentioned uh, some of some of these things, uh, uh, but I think this is more than just skills. Julio Levana is asking, what would be the career advice uh, for a young project manager currently in the construction industry and to become a leader or an executive? Yeah, I think it covers a lot of things that, that I've I've mentioned. Um, I know I'd start out with you gotta be, you gotta once you graduate you're, you're not done learning right you're gonna you're gonna have to learn your company's processes your tools the procedures the way you do it um you know it was in some sense working in state government was a little bit easier because we had one standard one highway design manual one bridge design manual we had our our, our, our specifications um and everybody had to follow them um, but you're in the consulting side, you got to understand different clients have different process procedures, right? So you got to learn, learn all that. So I think being a lifelong learner is important, not only early, but throughout your career. Um, communication, I, you know, I've said it many times already today, right? To prove, pra it takes practice. Um, no, don't be afraid to, you know, there, and there's organizations that can help if you're not, not um, a good speaker, for example, or you, or you, you struggle with that, or just writing, take courses, um, practice, le learn more, learn more about it. Um, I think, I think that's, that's important. Um, and take, I, you know, take, I, I had a lot of luck in my career by taking on assignments, um, or volunteering for things that people tend to shy away from or didn't want to get involved in. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I, I switched jobs three times, four times in my career without just like lateral transfers to even different areas um, because it was um, I thought it was an exciting challenging opportunity like going down to New York City working on the West Side Highway taking on Tap and Z um, and they always turned out well for me I always they ended up always I always end up getting a promotion a year or so later um, kind of have to you prove yourself in doing it partly maybe for taking on those challenging assignments so um, you know that's that's how I I did I you know I I know some people won't move without having a promotion or they won't do it without it but Again, if you're looking for advancing your career and learning to become a project manager, um, 
you may have to take those chances and just learn as much as you can about as much as you can in your in your whatever industry part whatever branch you're in um because the more well versed you are and rounded you are the more breadth of knowledge you have the better off you're going to be um, not only understanding where your job fits in but the bigger bigger picture my two cents no that was fantastic dan thank you so much for sharing your experience your expertise and and your time uh today with us um we have a winner for our scholarship and that is tolu sunny from the university of alabama congratulations tolu mm -hmm. Then again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I learned a lot and I enjoyed our conversation. And I wish you and everyone, uh, if I don't speak with you or see you or email you, happy holidays. Thank you. Yes, happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Take care.